everybody again. I know we uh, missed a couple people from the snow last week, but we're back. We're ready to bring the Holy Spirit. So if you're ready, we'll all sing along. Here we go. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Testimony from death to life. Cause Grace 3 wrote my story, and I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony from death to life. Grace rewrote my story, and I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Oh, we're not done yet. If I'm not dead. You're not done Cause greater things are still to come Oh, I believe If I'm not dead and you're not done See with me Cause greater things are still to come Oh, I believe If I'm not dead and you're not done story and I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony oh I'm alive this is my testimony from death to life this grace we wrote my story choice. 
stir our faith up now. We make a miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working. Keep 
are Jesus. You are hope, Lord. You are refuge, God. You are good. You are everything we need, Father. There is no one like you, Jesus. There's no one like you. God, I just believe right now as we are in this moment of just declaring out the name of Jesus, in this moment of declaring out the, the way that you make a path in our life when it's just so dark sometimes, Lord, that you are a provision, that you are a healer. And God, I just, I know that sometimes I need to be reminded that even when I don't feel like you're present, Lord, that you're still working in my life. You're still working in the circumstances, in the moments, Father. So teach us how to take those moments and sense your presence in the name of Jesus. I declare that over everyone in this room. We give you the rest of the service today, Father. Come have your way in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You guys can have a seat. I'm a senior. Um, I've been an intern here for almost a year. I'm Sarah. I'm a junior and I've been an intern for the past year. I'm Sky. I'm a sophomore and I've also been an intern for the past year. My favorite part of being an intern is just getting to build connection with the kids and the parents of the kids, everyone on staff, including the interns. It wasn't just busy work and just showing up on Sunday and making sure everything's ready to go, but we got to do a lot of cool projects like filming the lessons at like Carter Lake and at all these cool places. That's the spirit! Or should I say, the sword of the spirit? And doing breakouts on Wednesdays where we led tons of kids just like at the park and we just planned all these days for them. Being an intern is being willing to step out of my comfort zone. We had to adapt to a bunch of things, and I think it was really helpful for me to adjust to that mindset. I think the biggest thing I've taken away from this intern to internship is growing as a leader. Like Sarah said, being impactful, not just leading the younger kids, but being able to lead people my own age, even directing adults, telling them like, okay, this is what we need, and just being able to step up in own the leadership that I have. This whole internship has given me a greater sense of purpose and it's it's honestly just been really fun and it's a great way to get to know a lot more people here at the church and branch out. So for anyone who's like considering an intern being an intern, I would definitely say go for it and like don't let any fear hold you back because it is just it is so worth stepping out of your comfort zone for. And you don't even have to be interested to going into any kind of ministry to do it. It builds so many other skills that you can just use in life. So I would definitely say look into it. So if you love Jesus and you love kids and you have a desire to learn more about who God is creating you to be, I invite you to check out more about our high school internship with children's ministry. You can simply go online to graceplace.org, scroll all the way down to the bottom and check out our employment section. There you'll find a job description and a way to apply online. I look forward to seeing your application soon. I'm in the no cavity club. <laughs> Breastplate of righteousness with the life jackets while we were paddle boarding. That moth just got burnt alive. <laughs> if you like to go on a zip line. <laughs> we have some fun around here with the end. Well, speaking of having fun, what do we have here? We got some wrestlers. Oh, yeah, sumo yeah. fighting. We're fighting each other currently. Yeah. She represents 9 a.m. service, boo. Can I get a boo? Okay. I represent 10.30. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's get ready no. to rumble. Yeah. We're raising food for an h &S food drive. We've got one week left, and we're at about 1,000 pounds, but our goal is 4,000. So, so you have a week to get about 3,000 pounds of food. But you can do it. All of you can do it. More specifically, 1030 can do it, because we want to win. But we have an update. Right, last week, 1030 was in the lead. Yeah, yeah. But now, 
We have an update. So we have an update. One of us has 748 pounds. And one of us has 255 pounds. So there's quite a the clear difference. leader currently. And Anna, go ahead and tell them who's winning. I'm, I'm proud to say that 9 a.m. is way ahead of you guys. Uh -oh. yeah. uh -oh. We had a big upset this week. We were not expecting <laughs> a comeback. And, but I'm thinking comeback season part two. Heck no. You're and going down 10, 10, 30. No, no, no. I think the 10, 30 is going to come back. No. Anna. no. Yes, and I'm going to win. No. Yeah. Nope. Nope. Gonna... Who's nine? You're nine? No, I'm she's nine. nine. You're nine. Yeah, Who thinks I'm... nine's going to win? Yeah. Nobody. <laughs> That's right. All right. That's right. Who thinks 1030 is going to win? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, you got I a like lot of work energy. to do next week if that's if that's going to be true. Okay, you guys. I'm just saying. I'm you're going, going down. Up. No, you're going down. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're going down. <laughs> All right, anyway. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I tell you, if you decide, teenagers, that you want to be an intern next year, I guarantee you, you're going to have some fun, and you're going to bring some fun. We've had a really good season with these interns over this last school year, and it's continuing. Hey, if you would like to support the ministry of God's work through Grace Place, as you know, we always say there's three ways to give. If you're here, you can give in the giving boxes if you so prefer. If you're online or you're here, you can also give through our website or by texting. And we appreciate how you are participating together as a church family in order to fuel God's work through this church. We always say you don't give to Grace Place, you give through Grace Place. And that's the truth. And uh, this is a, a good week to give, especially if you got some surprises this week. My wife and I got a surprise. We, we got some stimulus money just showed up, miracle in our account. And so the first thing Celine did was grab her phone text that number that you saw on the screen and sent 280 in through the, the ministry work of Grace Place because that's part of our worship. First fruits off the top, first 10%. It, our worship includes singing, it includes praying, it includes Bible reading, it includes a lot of things, but very high on the list of what is true worship is putting God first when we get our income. And so thank you for, for all of you who also participate that way. Well, we're coming to the end of the first of three parts in a longer series called Believe. And we're going to take two weeks off from this service. And we're going to, uh, next week was Palm Sunday, and the next week is Easter. And so we're excited. It's just two weeks away from Easter, and then we'll come back into phase two of this Believe series. On Easter, we're going to have five services. We're going to have two on Saturday night and three on Sunday. And the times are all changed, so take a look at that. Go online under events, and please RSVP for which service you're coming to. That helps us know if we need to close one because of our capacity limits, or if we need to open up another one. We shut down the seven o'clock in the morning because it just wasn't popular. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Go on there and pick one of those. And by the way, we're going to be offering baptisms in every service. So if you're thinking about being baptized, please let us know so that we can plan that with you. Our topic today is eternity. How many remember the, reading the Peanuts cartoons in the newspaper? Young people? We used to have this thing called newspapers. <laughs> and they could actually be delivered to your front porch. Anybody ever have a paper route? Any of you? Yeah, me too. And we had to roll the papers and put, uh, you know, rubber bands around them and put them in our little satchel bag thing. And I got on my you know, Stingray, twin Stingray bicycle and went around and tried to hit people's porches. Sometimes I went in the bushes, but usually I was pretty good at it. And then people would get their newspapers and they would open them up and they would read the news, the weather, the sports. But there was always some comics in there too. That's fun. And one of my favorites is a conversation between Lucy and Linus. I got it for you here. So Lucy's looking out the window and she says, boy, look at it rain. What if it floods the whole world? And Linus says, it will never do that. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that would never happen again. And the sign of the promise is the rainbow. Lucy says, you've taken a great load off my mind. And I love his reply. 
sound theology has a way of doing that. <laughs> sound theology inspires hope and removes fear. And so many people are afraid when they think about the end. When they think about the return of Jesus, they think about the final judgment, they think about well, what, what to believe about heaven, hell, that, and all, what's, what's ahead. And, and they're filled with fear, and that is not God's will for you. He does not want you to be a person who is filled with fear. He wants you to know the truth and be encouraged by it and allow sound theology to take a load off your mind. Now, those of you who are, are reading, doing scripture reading together, many of us are at, at different levels, our kids, our teens, adults. The chapter for reading this week was broken up into five sections. The end of life, the intermediate state, the return of Christ, the resurrection, and a new heaven and a new earth. And I was going to just pick one of those, but I decided I'm going to just spend a little time on all five of those phases. This could very easily be a five-part sermon series. So buckle up, because we're going to go right through it, okay? We're going to look briefly at each of these stages, beginning with the ending of life. Now, when you read the early chapters of the Bible, you know that God intended for humans to live forever and be in face-to-face -face relationship with Him. But of course, sin brought consequences, ugly consequences, including what the Bible calls the greatest enemy, death. And so in this fallen world, obviously, every human dies eventually. Well, most. We read about Elijah getting caught up in a fiery chariot. That was a cool story. But most of us do, except for the final generation. Did you know there's going to be a, people, a group of people who are alive on earth when Jesus comes back who will never die? They'll be just transformed into a glorified body. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians 15. That's, that'd be pretty cool to be a part of that group. But, but here's what I want you to hear first off about death. If I trust Christ, I do not fear death. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. So that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are sleep. Paul uses the word sleep for death. Jesus often used that word for death as well. Why? I think because it's not scary. When you go to sleep, you wake up in the morning, right? Nothing to fear. And notice a couple truths in the words we just read. First, hope in Christ changes the way I grieve. The text says, you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Now, that doesn't mean that believers never grieve. No, God's the one that created tear ducts and is healthy to grieve when you lose your, your loved one, your friend. And, and, and they, like the text says, they fall asleep in death. Yeah, we miss them. We do grieve, but it's, there's different types of grief. If, if those who died are in Christ, and if you're in Christ, it changes the way you grieve. We grieve as believers in a different way from unbelievers, atheists, pagans. They don't have any hope beyond the grave. It's over forever. That's really hard to deal with. And I've seen people trying to deal with it over the years. As a pastor, I've, I've several times been in, a, in, a, in a, a room or in a hospital where someone either died right there while we were talking or had just died before I got there. And I, it's such a stark contrast sometimes watching the way people grieve who have hope and who do not have hope. And, and I've, I've always remembered this one fellow who his father had just died, as I'm walking into ICU, he's outside the room and he's going like this with his head against the wall and he's, he's got tears in his eyes and, he, and I, I heard him say, I'll never see him again. I'll never see him again. And my heart was breaking for him because there is a hope that can change the way you grieve. And notice second, hope for the future is rooted in the gospel. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. I thought we were talking about the, the second coming here, Paul. Yeah, we are. But here's how we have hope 
for the future is looking to the past. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. See, thinking about death and the end of time and standing in judgment before a holy God would be terrifying if it were not for the truth of the gospel. But, but Paul can't talk about the hope that we have for the future without reminding us of something that happened in the past. Our only hope for the future is rooted in the perfect finished work of Jesus for us. That's where we put our trust. That's where we gain our confidence. He summarizes the essence of the gospel, the good news, in the words we just read, stating that Jesus died and rose again. And we are going to celebrate that resurrection in two weeks. And we, we, we celebrate it every day and every week, but especially on Easter. And listen, if it didn't happen, if, if that did not happen, that Jesus died and rose again, then forget about the future. There is no future. When you're dead, you're dead and it's over. It's the end. Goodbye. It's over. But because that happened, it changes everything for those who put their faith in Jesus. Death is not the end. God will bring all of his children who have fallen asleep back. And, and Jesus will give them resurrected bodies. So don't be afraid of death. If you put your faith in Jesus, if you have it, please do as soon as possible. The Believe book the collection of scriptures. I've really enjoyed the way Randy Frizee, the editor, is organizing and arranging the scripture reading for each week. Um, I, I like Randy, by the way. I don't know him well, but he taught a class I took down at Denver Seminary when I was working on my doctorate degree years ago, and I got a chance to go out to lunch with him one day and pick his brain about some things. He's a good man. But I wish this week he would not have included the story of the rich man and Lazarus as the illustration of what happens when we die. Because I do not believe that's the point Jesus was making. Now, we can agree to disagree on a lot of things, and including this. Obviously, Randy and I disagree. But the story is found in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. Without reading the whole story, let me just summarize it for you. There, Jesus is telling a whole string of parables and he comes to this point and he says, there's a man, a rich man, very rich, nice clothes, great food, big mansion. And outside the mansion, there's a beggar with sores all over him and he's so hungry, he's just hoping for some scraps from the rich man's table. His name's Lazarus. And dogs come and lick his sores. He's, he's a pitiful case. But then they both die and the beggar, Lazarus, he goes to paradise. It's not called that in the, in the text. It's Abraham's bosom. He goes to Abraham's bosom. And the rich guy ends up in Hades. And he's being tormented by fire. And he looks across a big chasm and he can see Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. And he shouts across and he says, Abraham, send Lazarus to bring me a drop of water on his tongue because I'm suffering in these flames. And Abraham says, no, you can't get across that chasm either way. And he says, well, then tell him to go warn my five brothers so they don't end up in this torment I'm in. And Abraham says, they have Moses and the prophets. They can listen to the scriptures. And, and he shouts back, but if somebody was raised from the dead, they would believe. And he says, no, if they won't believe the scriptures, they won't believe if someone is raised from the dead. Now that story, I believe, is a parable, not a description of a real experience. Let me give you a few reasons why I believe that. First of all, it comes in a list of parables. Parables are usually short, fictitious stories with a spiritual punch, a point, a lesson. Furthermore, it contains what most would, I think, agree is an impossible conversation. <laughs> because uh, from this rich man in Hades is speaking directly to Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, and there's nothing in the Bible that suggests people will be able to watch each other or converse from heaven and hell. It uses clear symbolic imagery that can't be taken literal. For example, how could one little drop of water on a person's finger stay there through flames and actually help somebody and quench their thirst. And it uses figurative expressions like 
Do, do people who died, who, who died with faith in Christ, end up in Abraham's literal bosom? I mean, how big is his bosom? <laughs> this must be a figurative expression, in my opinion. And if you do some research, you'll find that this story was already a very familiar folktale in Jewish culture. Been around for a long time before Jesus used it to make a point. And he used it to make a point, I believe, if you look at the whole context, about the danger of greed and relying on riches. You look at the context right before it, the story before it is about that, and, he, and in the surrounding it is this context. It's a warning. And it also ends with a reminder that if people will not believe what God has taught them in the scriptures, even if they saw a resurrection from the dead, they wouldn't believe. And sure enough, just a short time later, Jesus raises someone from the dead, whose name, by the way, is also Lazarus. And many still don't believe. And then Jesus himself comes out of the tomb. And many still don't believe. Another point of the story, I believe. N.T. Wright is one of the most well-known, respected theologians of our day, alive right now. I've read a number of his books and really appreciate his scholarship. He writes this, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus is to be treated precisely as a parable, not as a literal description of the afterlife and its possibilities. It is therefore inappropriate to use it as a standard post-mortem scenario. It is rather an adaptation of a well-known folk tale, projecting the rich-poor divide of the present on the future in order to highlight the present responsibility and culpability of the careless rich. I agree with that. So I agree, I disagree with Randy on using this parable to literally describe what happens when you die. And that's okay. We can agree to disagree on these, these secondary doctrinal issues when we unite around the main thing in the gospel. There's room for different views on, on what happens. And there has been debate about it down through Christian history. I personally do not believe that there is currently, right now, a place where people are being tortured. Jesus talks a lot about hell, but he always talks about it connected to the final judgment and the renewal of all things, which is still future. And, and so I have to ask myself, why would people be punished before the judgment? Why would they be tormented for years and years and then they're pulled out to get judged and then sent back? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think so. There have been historically two beliefs about what happens when believers die, after they die. And the majority view, of course, is that you immediately enter God's presence as a spirit being. And that seems to be supported by the Apostle Paul when he says in Philippians 1.23, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. He says, for me to die is gain, to live as Christ, to die is gain. It's going to be far better. Historically, there has been a minority view. You can trace this back through the Protestant Reformation and, and, and farther. Um, and that is a view which understands these texts that talk about death as sleep to, to say that a person, when they die, they're unconscious until Jesus returns in the resurrection. Regardless of which view you hold, as a believer in Jesus, the next thing you see after you die will be his face. We can all agree on that. And what the Bible repeatedly encourages us to look forward to, stage three, is the return of Christ. Jesus promised to come back. And the Bible calls it the blessed hope. This is something that should fire us up, that we should be looking forward to. Not like, oh, I hope he doesn't come back before I get to do this and this and this and all the cool stuff I want to do in this world. No, this is the blessed hope. This is going to be better than anything we've ever experienced. The next two verses that we're going to read in 1 Thessalonians 4 form a creedal statement of the early church, summarizing the basic understanding of the second coming of Jesus. Let's read it. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Now, notice a few things in those words we just read. First of all, it says, the Lord himself will come down from heaven. 
It's not a spiritual, mystical thing. It's a real thing. Literal, physical, personal. It, it's not something that happens when you die and, and Jesus comes to you and that's the second coming for you. No, no, it's, it's not a dream. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he did so publicly. And in Acts 1.11... Angels showed up alongside the apostles as they were watching Jesus disappear. And they said this, this same Jesus will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. So it's going to be literal, physical when Jesus returns. And just because it says he comes down doesn't mean heaven is above us or far away. It's not a distant planet. It's another dimension right alongside us. And that's why sometimes it talks about him coming down. Other times it talks about him being revealed or it talks about the appearing of our Lord and Savior. We're going to drop that veil between these two dimensions that Jesus is going to show up. And notice his return will be quite dramatic with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet call of God. The New International Version Study Bible says in the note on this verse, some hold that this will be secret. But Paul seems to be describing something open and public with loud voices and a trumpet blast. And with that, I would agree. Dramatic when Jesus returns. Public, loud, visible to all. And at the same time, there will be, phase four, the resurrection. Verse 16, and the dead in Christ will rise first. God understands DNA. He created it. We discovered it not long ago. But didn't surprise him. <laughs> He's the one that designed it. That means he knows how to recover your exact genetic code. And recreate a new, glorified, perfect, eternal body for you. And I look forward to that. It's going to be still you, only better. There's going to be, you'll be recognizable as the same person, but with some definite upgrades. Anybody need some upgrades? I do. I need more hair on my head. And some of you can relate. <laughs> Verse 17 says, After that we, will, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, this is the only place where this idea of being caught up is mentioned. Um, the word rapture. I, I usually don't use the word rapture because uh, I feel like there's a lot of confusion in our uh, um, theological culture about that. And the word's not in the Bible. The place the word rapture comes from is this word caught up in the Greek. When it's translated into Latin, it sounds like kind of like the English word rapture, okay? But another word is interesting here as well, and that's the word meet. It says we will meet the Lord in the air. And the word for meet, the Greek word, was a technical term in the ancient world. It was used to describe a delegation of citizens leaving the city to go out and meet an arriving dignitary in order to escort and usher him or her back into the city as an act of respect and honor. And these, these formal processions out and back were common in those days. There are several examples in the Bible of this, by the way. And so I think Paul wants us to get this image of the whole church, resurrected, glorified bodies, meeting the Lord and us escorting him back to earth with joy. God's people suddenly swept up into his presence. Imagine being alive when Jesus returns and literally lifted into the clouds with the angels and saints to greet him. Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3, that there will be a final judgment when the Lord returns, and it will be followed by the destruction of the ungodly, and that the earth will be cleansed with fire. God's not going to blow up the earth, but he's going to cleanse it of all the impact of sin. And if he's cleansing the, the, the earth with fire, I'd rather be watching that from the air than experiencing it on the ground myself, wouldn't you? That's what this text says is going to happen. You say, wow, that's pretty dramatic. Yeah. Yeah. Merging heaven and earth is going to be dramatic too. We'll get there in a minute. Listen, Jesus said in John 5, 28 and 29, Do not be amazed at this. For a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live. Those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. Notice, both the righteous and the wicked are going to be raised for the final judgment. 
uh, there's actually two judgments. We're gonna, not going to get in that today, but there's one for the wicked and there's one for the righteous. The one for the wicked is very different. The one for the righteous is about rewards and, and commendation. It's not about whether you're, you're saved or lost. That decision has been made when you trusted Jesus. But notice, both the righteous and the wicked are going to be alive at one time. Everyone who has ever lived before alive at one time. Can you imagine that? And, and if you think that's impossible, keep in mind that the current world population is somewhere around the size of all the people who had lived before. So it'd be like just doubling the number that the earth holds now. Now, some people get confused and there, there's a teaching that is circulating in some churches called universalism. And that's the idea that God's going to save everybody. That he's, he's a loving father, and even if you're bad, he's going to save you. It doesn't matter. Well, he is a loving father. And it's true. Even if you're bad, he'll save you if you put your faith in Jesus. But he's not going to save you if you don't want to be with him. He's not going to force you to do something that will make you miserable. If you want to go a different direction, if you, if you want to thumb your nose at him and refuse his offer of salvation, sadly, there will be those who are lost. Jesus said, Matthew 10, 28, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one, capital O, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. This is an interesting verse because Jesus says that people who experience hell will be destroyed in both soul and body. Now, it's hard for me, as I said, to imagine that anybody would be in hell now if there's going to be a final resurrection of all people followed by some being saved and some being condemned. And that destruction of both soul and body in hell happens. Now, if you trust the Bible and you trust Jesus specifically, then believing in hell is not optional because Jesus talked about it quite a bit. But how do we interpret it? What does it mean? There are different beliefs on what hell will look like, what that experience will be. And that's been true historically down through the centuries. Basically, you can summarize the three major positions as this. Literal, metaphorical, or conditional. The literal view of hell is kind of the medieval view that hell is to be understood as people literal. Metaphorical view, which has become much more of a um, mainline view with scholars today, is that hell is separation from God and it's not going to be a good thing. And so there are these different metaphors that are used like fire and outer darkness Jesus said some people will be cast into outer darkness, which sounds very different than bright flames. But these are metaphors to describe something that you don't want to experience, a form of punishment. The third view, though, is, some, is called the conditional view. Sometimes it's called the annihilationist view. And that, this view uh, is called the conditional view because it, it asserts that eternal life is conditional on accepting Jesus. The wages of sin is death not life in a bad place. It's death, and the gift of God is eternal life, and eternal life is conditional on accepting Jesus. So in this view, hell is real, but eternal fire is eternal in its results, not its duration. Its results are what are, is eternal. God will annihilate the souls of the wicked rather than punish them endlessly. Now, whatever view you pick, we can still be friends. We don't have to you know, ha have an argument over this, but make sure you study all of what scripture teaches on this. I personally do not believe God will supernaturally keep unbelievers alive in order to torment them throughout endless ages. And that, that's, that's because of careful Bible um, study. Unfortunately, in my opinion, many have been turned away unnecessarily from Christianity because they've been taught what N.T. Wright calls, quote, a childish view of hell, hell as a literal underground location full of worms and fire, or for that matter, as a kind of torture chamber at the center of God's castle of heavenly delights. The Bible tells us that hell is not intended for people at all 
but for the devil and his angels. But those who insist on defiantly rejecting the Lord will be destroyed. Jesus said, Matthew 25, 41, then he, said, he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I sincerely hope and pray that none of you gathered here or watching or listening will be in that group that is described in Revelation 20 after the final judgment as thrown into the lake of fire, as it's called in Revelation 20. Don't, don't go there. Put your faith in Jesus and don't ever, ever, you won't ever have to have fear again about the end, about the second coming, about the judgment, about death, about hell. No, because listen, Jesus already suffered hell for you on the cross. That's good news. That brings us to the final stage, five, a new heaven and a new earth. I love talking about this. You see, when Jesus came forth from the tomb in a resurrected body, the curse of sin and death was reversed forever. Everything changed forever on this earth and for all who dwell on it. It, it changed for, for people and for animals and for the planet itself. You see, God started a renewal process at the resurrection of Jesus that will ultimately culminate in the resurrection of all God's children and, in fact, in the resurrection of this entire cosmos. Jesus promised to return and to bring completion, the kingdom that he began. And, and when he returns, he called his return the renewal of all things. Don't miss that phrase in Matthew 19, 27. Through 29, Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, the, the Greek word is palin genesis. It's two words, genesis, creation, and palin is new. It's a new creation. At the renewal of all things, when, when the son of man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Now, Jesus made it clear here that there will be rewards in the future life. For those who have followed him, for those who have, have served him, for those who have sacrificed for him in this life. And, and when Peter says, what will there be for us? Jesus didn't say, bad question, Peter, be quiet. No, he said, there will be rewards. And in fact, if you had to give up something to follow Jesus, you will get paid back a hundred times, Jesus said, what was lost. But notice when that happens. He's not talking here about about going to heaven when you die. He's talking about when he returns and sets up, as the text says, his glorious throne. He's talking about when he returns and restores all things on earth. He calls it the renewal of all things, not the destruction of all things. Unfortunately, and this really bothers me because it, it doesn't have to be true. Unfortunately, most people aren't too excited about eternity because they think it's going to be less real than this earth. And it frankly sounds terrible. It sounds boring the way people describe eternity too often. It's one of the weaknesses, unfortunately, of, of Christianity in modern times is trying to provide a vision of heaven that really motivates and excites people because Christians have too often just borrowed medieval imagery from paintings and, 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 and they've associated heaven with boring images of halos and harps and clouds and effeminate figures with wings. Islam, by contrast, offers a celestial playboy mansion. You're getting some converts there, I guess. Country singer uh, Kenny Chesney states a lot of people's feelings, I think, when he sings Everybody want to go to heaven. It beats the other place. There ain't no doubt. Everybody want to go to heaven, but nobody want to go now. Yeah, we don't want to go the other direction, but we tend to think that this life we're living right here is more real and more enjoyable than what God has in store for us in eternity. That's wrong thinking. Let's get our minds corrected by his word. 
The reason we don't get excited about just being eternal spirit beings forever in a, in a, uh, a realm that's not physical is because we weren't created for that. God created us. And that's why our heart longs for reality the way he made us, that we would be real people with real bodies, living in a real world, doing real things. And that's what the Bible tells us where we can look forward to in the new earth. That's the grand finale of the whole plan. Real people, real bodies, real earth, doing real things. Like we're growing, we're learning, we're loving, we're building, we're achieving, we're enjoying relationships and the work of our hands taking care of God's animals and all of his creation, having great adventures. That's what we're made for. And that's what we can look forward to. Someday, heaven and earth will be one. The meek will inherit the earth, Jesus said. God says in Isaiah 65, 17, See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. God's, God's not going to destroy the, the earth. He's going to renew it, restore it, recreate it. In fact, merge heaven and earth together. Read the last two chapters of the book. The, the new Jerusalem that's now in, in God's presence in heaven is going to come in, into our reality. He's going to merge these two dimensions. And we're, God is physically going to live with us on this earth forever. He's going to make it the headquarters of the universe. All the bad memories of sin will fade away. And it says there in Revelation that God himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Acts 3, 20, 21. God will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah, for he must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. Not a destruction, not an evacuation, but restoration is what God has in store. And I don't know about you, but that gets me excited. It gets me excited. There's so many things I love doing that I look forward to doing forever in eternity in the earth made new. Believe the truth. Eternity is more real, not less real. This life is as wonderful as it is, and there's so much good about it along with all the bad. But, but all the things you love about this life, it's only the preface for the great adventure story that's ahead. Many believers don't seem to really believe it. And, and they are living for this life and afraid that, they've, that they're going to miss this old life when they have to depart from it. How many of you have experienced the unexpected surprise and blessing of somehow getting bumped to first class on an airplane flight? Oh, many of you have. I've given high fives over that one. Yeah, it's it's quite it's quite a change, isn't it? Uh, Even business class, yeah, it's pretty good too. But first class, man, there's nothing like that. And 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 for those of you who raised your hand and gave high fives over that, uh, did you? miss your old seat when that happened? No, of course not. How could you? Because you still had everything you had before, but now everything's better. Leg room, service, meals, silverware, free adult beverages before you even take off, hot towel to wash with. Not only were the bad things of economy class removed, but get this, The good things of economy class were retained and yet made better in first class. So it will be in the renewal of all things. Like Linus said to Lucy, sound theology has a way of taking a great load off your mind. And I sincerely hope that you will be able to face without fear Death, the end of the world, the final judgment, without fear because you have hidden your life in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the promises of your word, for sound theology that that has a way of taking a load off of our minds when we get it right. I pray that every person listening and, and, and participating in this prayer will give their lives to you put their faith in you, allow you to remove all fear from their hearts when they think about the future. And instead, replace that fear with enthusiasm 
and joy. And so as we, as we worship you now, may it be informed by these realities and may we do so with, with enthusiasm and with gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen.
rises up a thousand generations that you are worthy, Lord of all. Unto you the slain and risen King, we lift our voice with heaven, singing worthy, Lord of all. Oh, thank you that today we can <laughs> join with eternity. We can join with heaven and, and declare in one voice, one same declaration that you are Lord of all, no matter what tomorrow holds, you are Lord of all. So God, in this place, in this congregation, I just pray your blessing over each one of us here, and that we can leave this building and represent you, reflect Christ to a world around us in the name of Jesus. Blessings to everyone here. And I just want to remind everybody, if you want prayer for anything, we're going to have a prayer partner. It's back in this corner right here. It says, need prayer. Uh, so go get your prayer on. Otherwise, be blessed. We'll see you next week. Take care.